Brummagem Bells, um, bells cast by Blues, Barwell and Carr. Uh, what I hope to do is to tell you a little bit about the history of each of those foundries and uh, tell you about the bells they've cast and also the later history, because one of the things people often say is, what, what happened to them? Weren't they still going in the 60s? Stuff like that. Uh, well, I hope to be able to tell you uh, about that as we go through. I um, took on this lecture because I'd been meaning to complete writing up the three firms for some time. I did an article on blues for the ringing world a good 30, maybe even 40 years ago. Um, but I've also researched the others over quite a long period of time. So what I'm doing tonight really is sharing that with you. But in the process, um, I've done a fair amount of, uh, of additional research to fill some gaps. And as a result of that, I only finished writing this talk about five minutes ago. And there's still a few little um, uh, bits that could do with a bit more finesse. Anyway, here we go. Well, we're going into Victoria and Birmingham. Um, this, of course, is a very proud city, uh, a place full of enterprise, full of activity and real energy uh, in the air. Um, it was a place where there were good public buildings, a lot of um, public spirited work going on, uh, a really lively place. And uh, of course, it was the city of a thousand trades. One of those trades was bell founding. Victoria herself was just coming to the throne in 1837, uh, about the time the, um, the, the town hall was being built. And uh, it's the Victorian era that we're mainly looking at, though it spills over into the Edwardian period too. So that's the context. As far as bells are concerned, um, at the start of Victoria's reign, uh, Victoria, the Whitechapel really did have the supremacy of the market. Um, the, the point was that a number of other foundries had, uh, had closed. Um, the, um, sorry, but what you don't know is that I've got a, a bar of the, um, the Zoom stuff at the top of the screen and it has, hides part of the text. <laughs> Um, there the had been a decline in the market for bells, as Richard Smith's recent article in the Ringer World shows through the 1830s. And alongside that, and independently, many of the older family businesses of found, founders had gone out, had gone, had, had closed down. The Bilbies in the West Country and the Penningtons, also in the West Country, had both uh, closed down in, 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 just around the time of the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, the Bridgewater founders had, had lingered on until the 1820s, um, but those were just some of the casualties in, in the West of England. Nearer to London, Whitechapel had bought up several foundries and, um, and the plant had gone to, gone to Whitechapel. That included John Bryant of Hartford, the Wells Foundry of Aldbourne, um, William Dobson of Downham Market, and in Gloucester, the Ruddle Foundry, which was really the dominant player in the market uh, for bells through most of the 18th century. Um, the Mears kept Gloucester open uh, until 1846. At the time, tailors were already at Loughborough in 1840, uh, but they were still in a relatively small way of business. They were actually starting to get quite big and they grew quickly. Uh, but on that, just at the cusp of 1840, the business was still quite small. There were a handful of other small time founders, uh, but of course, many of the new entrants of the 19th century were not there yet. And those are the firms we're going to be looking at. So if you wanted bells in 1840, it was most likely you'd end up going to Mears. These figures, I think, show the, the situation. Um, the, the number of bells cast in, in, uh, in each of those years from 1838 to 1842. And you'll see that um, Whitechapel actually had 80% of the market. Uh, all the other firms that were active are there. And um, the tailor's proportion um, shows as, as not being that great compared to the rest, for example. But all this was about to change. The market was about to get bigger and more firms were going to come into it. The main factors are along the bottom there. First of all, you've got the Victorian church restoration movement, the building of new churches needing bells. You've got the ringing revival in the Belfry reform movement and the huge interest in public buildings, uh, installing clocks and bells uh, for those. So the market was about to get a lot bigger. The 19th century provincial firms then um, were, were these. Uh, Sorry, I've lost my text at the top again. I, I don't know a way of dealing with this. Maybe that's better. So the bell founding firms outside London had shrunk to around 20% of the market. Uh, there were always other general founders uh, casting approximations of bells, some in the north, in the northwest, for example, around Liverpool, casting things that they were selling as bells, but they didn't really make a very musical so sound. They were just things that had what people assumed to be an approximate bell shape. 
And gradually, these new firms came on and took up bell founding as business opportunities increased. These are the major new starts. And you'll see that three of them, Blues, Barwell and Carr, were asterisk, were in Birmingham. The only other firm that came anywhere near those firms in terms of output was Llewellyn's and Jones in Bristol from the 1870s through to 1940, um, casting some 600 bells. Whereas in Birmingham, Barwell's cast 510, Carr's 465, and you get the picture. Um, the, um, the output of many of the others was, was relatively small compared to, the, compared to the Birmingham people. Not all of these firms that I've listed here traded throughout the period, and only two of them were still active in 1939. Uh, that's Gillitz and, um, and uh, Llewellyn's and James. Um, so we come, we come on to uh, the start of the, of the industry in Birmingham. I'm in Houston. I have a problem. Oh, there we go. It never happens in the practice, does it, Chris? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, the, the page down didn't work. Um, right. But of course, in Birmingham, there had been a foundry earlier in Joseph Smith of Edgbaston, who was casting bells between 1701, his first bells were at Handsworth, uh, through to his death in 1735 to 6. Some of the rings included Northfield, which have now gone, Alfchurch, five of which are still there, Hales Owen, most of which are still there. And Smith produced uh, lovely looking bells and actually rather good sounding bells too. So there was a predecessor industry in Birmingham, but uh, until some time later, they didn't revive. Birmingham was the city of a thousand trades. And uh, a notebook at Taylor's has this little list of bell founding competitors in other parts of the country around, eight, around 1840. And you'll see there's a list of names there in Birmingham, Barker, Bartlett, Beresford, uh, uh, Dowler, Evans, Fidian, Shepherd, none of those names that would readily spring to mind if we think of bell founders that we know of. There are a number of bells about that were cast in Birmingham. There's a blank bell on the, on the church at Spurnell near, near Studley. Um, we know to have been cast in 1862, uh, and, but it was from an unnamed Birmingham founder. It's a bell of about 200 weight. And that's the sort of size limit of, the, of what these, uh, these small town bell founders were casting. These bells were all cast uh, from solid patterns, not, uh, not molded in loam. Some more examples, there's a little bell at Hockley Heath dated 1834, probably made in Birmingham. At Gentleshaw in Staffordshire, um, Eric Speak found a bell by Barlow, undated I think, but this was probably James Barlow of Staniforth Street, Birmingham, who's mentioned in 1830 as a founder of house bells. At Holywell Cemetery in North Wales, there's a bell by George Dowler of Birmingham, 1857. And Dowler was the first to react when William Blues and Company in 1867 claimed to have cast the first bells made in Birmingham. I beg to take objection to the term revival of an old, old craft. I was unconscious of the fact as stated by a reporter that this trade had become extinct in Birmingham. I have recently supplied bells to various churches in this and adjacent towns, and he's hoping to get bigger, more orders and make bells of bigger size. But um, I, I think Timmins sums up what the situation generally uh, very nicely in a book that coincidentally came out in 1866, the year before blues got going. He says that since the 18th century, there's no record of large church bells in Peels having been cast in the town, although an extensive trade in other types of bells has flourished and continued to extend. There's plantation bells, railway bells, musical hand bells, cattle bells, sheep bells, house bells, sleigh, dray and comparison bells, fancy table office and call bells, all of which he gives a description to and indicates the size and so on. So far from there being no bell foundering in Birmingham, there was, and there were even something like 200 employed, people employed in the industry, um, but none of them were actually casting proper bells, church bells. So that brings us to the main subject of tonight's talk, uh, which is the work of Blues, Barwell and Carr. As you'll see, Birmingham was to become a significant centre of bell founding for some 60 years. If you look at their total combined output, um, there's uh, almost 1,500 bells there cast between them, and that's ignoring all the smaller ones. 
Uh, the numbers of sets of bells there show that they were casting sets of six and, and eight bells. Uh, Bauer, for example, cast 10 sets of eight, and also um, a, a 12 that we'll see. And uh, Blues cast a set of 15 bells for a carolin for India. Otherwise, though, uh, it, the, the rings were eight and below, but quite large numbers. All three firms undertook bell hanging work too. Um, Blues rather less than the others, but Barwell particularly was active in that field. They all continued to make a wide range of types of bells, including musical handbells. I'm not going to say much about handbells tonight, but there'll be a couple of passing references. Uh, but this was a, a, a part in the, the output of all these firms. Importantly, all three companies were basically brass founders doing a lo load of other work, and bell founding was just a sideline to their main business concerns. All of them, interestingly, employed well-known Birmingham ringers. In fact, the leaders of Birmingham ringing um, at times worked for these companies. And all of the firms existed for several decades, either side of their active bell founding years. But Brummagem Bells didn't have a terribly good reputation. Um, when he was writing in 1968 in the Central Council Welcome Booklet for Wor the Worcester Meeting, uh, in, uh, Paul Catamol, who taught me to ring, wrote, it's interesting to note that all three Birmingham founders, Carr, Blues and Barwell, were represented in the town of Evesham. The noise on a Sunday morning must have been appalling. Well, the Great Hampton Six were reckoned to be pretty bad. The Evesham Ten only had Barwell trebles and were thought to have been a, a, not a bad old style peel. And Benjworth remained there, uh, barely ringable, but they're, they're there. And they're a very typical Victorian period, neither objection appeal, neither objectionable, but certainly not excellent either. Funnily enough, there's a convergence of all three bells at St. Bartholomew's at Edgbaston. It was the parish church of the Blues and Barwell families, but the bell work in 1898 was done by Carr. Uh, the two trebles of the six were cast by Carr. One was a recast, one was a new bell. As you approach the church from the, uh, the northwest, there's a big pink monument right by the churchyard wall, and that's the Barwell family monument. And there in the, at the bottom of the column is James Barwell, the founder of the Bell Foundry. Inside the church, there's a stained glass window in the south aisle in memory of William Henry Maxwell Blues, who was the, the Blues Foundry, really, and his wife, Fanny Francis, who were married there in 1860. And uh, Fanny ended her days not far away at Spring Road in Edgbaston. So it's fascinating, really, that the three, fam the three firms, the three families, uh, all met at, uh, at Edgbaston, as it were. Well, taking the firms one by one, we'll start with Blues. Blues were the first on the block, as far as uh, proper bell founding was concerned. Um, and these are just some of their publicity materials. Uh, a price list for bills of four, five, six, and eight of various sizes, and an advertisement of the 1890s when the firm had more or less finished, listing some of the bills they'd cast, but this same advertisement had in fact run for almost two decades, the list has anyway. They did rather more than this. Now, the, uh, the history of the family and the business is roughly as follows. Uh, the family tree on the left is very crude, but you'll see that William H. M. Blues, who is really the, the bell founder um, from 1866, um, his father was William Blues, uh, born in 1793, uh, married to Anne Maxwell, where H. Uh, M. Maxwell's middle name came from. And William Blues I, we don't really know much about. The firm claimed to have been established in 1782, but uh, I haven't been able to find much about the business at all before 1830. Uh, William Blues, the, the elder, um, died in 1833, and William uh, Jr., um, 1793 to 1865, were attached to the old meetings, though nonconformists. Uh, but William Jr. was also connected with St. Martin's by 1832. Indeed, the four youngest children of the Blues family were all baptised at the old meeting and at St. Martin's, including William Henry Maxwell Blues. By 1830, William Jr. is a fire, brass and steel, fire and iron and brass candlestick maker, and later a brass founder, but you get the feel for the sort of work that he's doing. William Jr. was very active in politics in Birmingham as a liberal supporter and a councillor, nonconformity and, and uh, active politics quite often went together in Birmingham. Now, by 1851, William and WHM Blues were partners in, 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 the, in the company, um, but they was dissolved in 1860 owing to the debts of the, the younger Blues. Uh, blues was to be in trouble financially again later on. 
It was William Henry Maxwell who was chiefly responsible for develop, developing the Bell Foundry. The family and firm owned mining interests in Cornwall, useful for raw materials, and uh, they also had Russian business interests. And in fact, um, WHM Blues died having caught a, an extreme cold while returning from a business trip in Russia in 1887. Blues was in serious financial trouble in 1860, 1866, 1867, 1877, when uh, he effectively went, uh, went bankrupt, uh, but was allowed to continue trading. And in 1882, so it was always a borderline business, but the trouble was really with his main business rather than with his bell founding. He died in 1887, uh, as I say, on, on return from a trip to Russia. And although there's a son mentioned in 1871, I can't find out what happened to him. So there wasn't a, a successor in that sense. And his business uh, passed to his widow um, and it was sold very quickly to someone called Bissaker and uh, the bell founding plant went to Carr. And I'll tell you about that later on. Where was the foundry? Very close to the main line railway to London, not far from the Woodman pub. If you walk south from the Woodman, turn left and right under the railway arch, um, the, the site of the foundry was on the corner there. And you'll see in 1889, it's marked as church bell, chandelier and gas fittings works. There are modern buildings on the site now. The very first bells that we know of by Blues is, the, is this one at Coffs and Hackett, dated 1852, high up in a turret, but I did manage to get to see it when it, it was scaffolding up for repairs. This is a bell of about two and a half hundredweight, the standard sort of size for small Birmingham bells. But when Blues needed a bigger bell of four, four or five hundredweight, he had to go to Taylor's for it. And there's the job book entry for Taylor's for a bell they supplied for All Saints Hockley in 1862. So the, the Blues' business in 1850 was making brass imperial metal candlesticks, candle and oil lamps, standard weights, fire brasses, door knockers, plated snuffers, Britannia metal and British placewares, and they were also bell founders. They won a prize at the Great Exhibition in 1851 for some of these wares, and the medal was on their subsequent business stationery, as you can see at the bottom right. In 1862, the list of, um, list of goods being produced was much the same. Standard measures and weights, small bells, ship's bells, railway station, handbells, I won't read the lot out, metal and glass chandeliers, but still not church bells. They started casting church bells with quite a lot of, uh, of publicity in 1867. Uh, a very uh, good article in one of the Birmingham papers uh, went into a lot of detail about the casting, described what happened, and wished Blues every success in this new venture, which was bringing Bell founding back to the city of Birmingham. Dowler, as, as I've said, uh, complained and said, no, we've been casting bells all along, uh, but here's a bell, ca bell caster writing another letter coming to Blues's defense and saying, no, of course he's casting the first bells because he's raising these in, in loam, not just casting them from patterns. And the later business stationery very clearly says, bell and brass founders, the word bell comes first. The first peel cast in Birmingham was the eighth of Bishop Ryder, uh, dated 1868. There's a testimonial there at the bottom of Blues' advertisement. Uh, there's the church. And again, the ceremony was really quite well conceived as a public relations exercise because he, Blues invited all the top men of the day. Denison, uh, the, the man behind the uh, Big Ben in Westminster and a real expert on clock and bells. H.T. Uh, Ellicum, the, uh, the sort of instigator of the Belfry reform movement and Canon Catley from Worcester, who'd, uh, who got the new bells hung at the cathedral after a long campaign. And they were all there and, and uttering pronouncements in favor of, of blues right from, right from that, that time. So it's a good publicity coup and uh, the real casting appeal of eight, uh, most of which didn't need tuning, was a, a really good, um, good achievement for a brand new bell foundry. Some of the people involved with the works were these. Um, I, you wonder with all these firms where they got their expertise from. Well, in the case of Blues, but not really the others, we do know. Blues had actually recruited a man called Charles Pannell um, from Exeter to come and help him set up the Bell Foundry. They fell out very quickly. Blues, I, I gather, for was, for was very hot-tempered and impatient and even violent. And um, he sacked, sacked Pannell after about 18 months and uh, Pannell had to sue him for arrears of wages, but one. Pannell had, was, the, was uh, a member of the Bell Founding Company in um, Devon, 
that had revived the Bell Foundry in Columpton after the Bilbies closed down in the 1820s. Um, but that came to an end in 1853. Charles Pannell went to London and helped Warner's set up. And then he came to Birmingham. He set, his own, set up his own foundry in Exeter then in the 1850s, mid 1850s, and later came to Birmingham working for, for Blues when, when the thing was first kicking off. They didn't get on for long, uh, and uh, Pannell later worked for Barwell and died in Smethwick in 1882, not far from Cars. So I do wonder if he ended up working for all three firms. After um, Pannell came, uh, came James Ansell, who was the son of William Ansell, a bellhanger for Mears, and he came along as bellcaster and bellhanger in 1867. I uh, know quite a lot about him. John Bannister was another member of the firm, another helper. He was recommended by Ellicum as, as a bell tuner and considered the best tuner in England because he's naturally gifted with a very correct and delicate ear. He, I think, had a key role in Blues's progress as makers of musical handbells. Amos Cresser, Birmingham ringer, who died in 1893, was, uh, was foreman in 1869, later worked for other firms too. Steve Main came from Loughborough, uh, had worked for Taylor's as bellcaster from 18, 1871 right until the closure of the firm. So you get the picture here. There's some quite experienced people coming to Birmingham um, and good ringers too, who are uh, joining the firm and helping Blues along the way. Later on, Henry Bond of Burford uh, Jr. came to, uh, to learn this trade in Birmingham. And the family have these lovely photographs of, of, of uh, Henry Bond and also his little notebooks. And here are some of the bells he worked on while he was with Blues, the, the five bells for Parkminster Monastery down in Sussex. So this is actually particularly nicely documented. Blues won the competition, uh, won the job for uh, rehanging St. Martin's bells in 1870. Uh, two of the bells were recast and they were all rehung in a new frame that lasted until the present bells were put in. Um, the, um, there was a lot of local pride in this, you know, the fact this new bell foundry had been set up, matter of honour rather than pecuniary consideration, the peel should be uh, as perfect as possible, and if possible the work should be carried out within the borough. A lot of pressure, in other words, for the work to be awarded locally. Taylor at Loughborough, of course, had a very different, different view of it. St Martin's bells are very unfortunate. I was most shamefully treated in the matter. It was all in favour of in favour of blues. The ringers trying to first trying to secure Warner's, and then when he found he was out of their reach, laying hold of me. So he was only, Taylor was only called in as a make weight to give an alternative quote. Also, fragrantly unfair. There's much more to that story than, than I'm giving you here, but uh, quite a, quite a good spat happened there. The parish, at any rate, were pleased them, and Wilkinson, the rector, um, did a, a praiseworthy testimonial. The following year, after the work was done, um, Blues gave a set of 12 handbells to the St. Martin Society. Um, and as you, many of you will know, they've just very recently been restored. The tenor of the set has uh, an inscription on saying that they were presented by Blues in 1871. And um, after re-restoration re, uh, re by Bernard Stone, uh, they are looking and I gather sounding very well indeed. Um, Arthur very kindly provided these pictures for me and it just fits in so well with, uh, with, with uh, this, this little bit on, on Blues of Birmingham here. Blues did bell hanging too, uh, although Ansel was responsible for a fatal accident when one of the new bells at Kings Norton was being hoisted in 1867. There was an over eager bystander who got too close and a bell swung out of control and it damaged the organ and also caused, uh, caused a fatal accident. A sad incident. In the middle is a bell with very typical blues fittings, um, traditional style fittings with strap gudgeons, stock hoops, uh, ordinary ironwork, and, and, and uh, very typical fittings of the type before the Victorian engineers got going on them. Blues didn't always hang their own bells. Um, at least two jobs uh, in, went to what were done by Hooper and Stokes, the, the Woodbury bell hangers from Devon. Uh, Brails in Warwickshire, the big six. Aloha in Scotland, um, a lighter six, were both hung by, by Hooper and Stokes rather than by Blues. And uh, quite a lot of Devon commissions went by Hooper and Stokes too. So what about um, Blues peels that are still around? Uh, two fives, well, Yas and our six, but the, 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 the Blues five are still there. Um, the tenor inscribed in, in Australia, we sing the Lord's sound in a strange land. 
Interesting story about Yas, of course, because it was in the early editions of Dove. You, people may not know this, but it was in the early editions of Dove as Tass, which is how it appeared on that blues advertisement we looked at earlier. When George Pipe was in Australia in the uh, in the early 60s, he he and he got some others to go up to to, to Tass uh, from from Melbourne to have a ring on this 2500 weight five as they were shown as in Dove. When he got there, they found that it was Yas, of course, and the tenor was only 600 weight. Big disappointment after a long drive on the Australian dirt roads. So these are some of the surviving peels. There's a six at Bladen in Durham, Middlesmore in Yorkshire, um, uh, six at Barrington in Cambridgeshire, and three eights still, still remain. There's Rippenden and Walson up in Yorkshire, and Cravely um, down, down in the Black Country. And I can play, Cradley Bells were cast in 1873, exhibited at the Vienna Exhibition, um, and eventually installed at Cradley in, uh, in 1875. Let's have just a quick clip of them. I'm very grateful to James Brooks of the Cradley Ringers for providing that clip for me. Uh, but these are some of the blues pills that have gone. Uh, the survival rate of blues bells is only 61%. And that low percentage of, bell, of the remaining bells is due to the fact that many of them were repealed, have been recast. Um, Erdington Abbey is a lost eight. Um, blues cast them in 1877, but they're recast in 1950. Sixes at Mythamroyd, Netherton, recast by Taylors, and, Le and Leamington uh, Roman Catholic Church, too. <coughs> On the bottom right, there's Alloa, another six, um, and again, Taylors, um, Taylors didn't waste any time, recast them in the 20s. The Bishop Ryder Bells don't survive. They, too, went in the pot in 1923, and they're now at Harborn. <coughs> Slightly more interesting one, Lightcliffe Congregational Church had a six, one of very few nonconformist rings, uh, partly scrapped in 1938, and the rest went in 1978. Um, but two of the bells survive at Kimcote in Leicestershire. Some of the blues chimes have gone too. The most notable one, and, and of local interest, was the orphanage chime at Erdington. <coughs> Five clock bells, though blues had two goes at getting those right. 1871 to two, scrapped in 1964. All three work firms did quite a lot of work with clockmakers and supplied bells through the trade. Saltair Congregational Church in Yorkshire, another of the nonconformist rings, six, by, uh, six of 1,200 weight, um, four of them by Blues 1870, supplied through pots of Leeds, the clockmakers, who hung both those and Lightcliff that we just seen. Typical light clock chime at New Mills Town Hall in Derbyshire, Blues Bells, Potts Clock, 1875. Pots weren't the only customers. Uh, Cook of York were, were also important clockmakers of the 19th century, and uh, they bought several sets of bells from, from Blues, including this quite big bell at Manchester Crown Courts, 1508, um, with a clock by, uh, by Cook, 1871. Big bells, all three firms cast bells up to about a ton and a half, uh, and um, the ones that Blues cast are the Brailles tenor, uh, the biggest, and still there. Um, also, the old tenor at Shoreditch, which is now grounded in the church, and so, several bells that have now been recast. Uh, Trowbridge old tenor was 2200 weight, Haverford West, um, 2100 weight, and um, the tenor of the chime, which is still there, at Newport Roman Catholic Church in Wales. Braille's tenor is particularly interesting because it has a really nicely made facsimile inscription from the old medieval bell that was cracked and blues recast. Uh, the, the care taken in, uh, in casting that inscription on it uh, is very good indeed. A quick recording of it. Um, I always felt that Shoreditch tenor sounded almost identical. They, they, they were very similar in, in sound. And uh, a slightly strange story uh, to, to lighten the, the, the tone a bit. Um, blues, uh, there's a bell in Japan at Nagasaki, which of course was the victim of one of the 1945 atomic bombs. 
the bell itself survived and a member of the church that uh, that uh, worshipped there, uh, the replacement church, obviously, um, got interested in the bell. And Mr. Kobayashi came over to Birmingham in 1981, was made very welcome by the ringers at St. Martin's. These are his, are there any photo photographs, of, for, the scans of photocopies? Um, but he visited St. Martin's on a Sunday and, and rang, went and looked at the site of the foundry um, in Bartholomew Row and, and New Bartholomew Street, went up to see the bells, um, and uh, he was very keen to find out about blues. He went to Yass as well and sent me some photographs from there. I had quite a lot of correspondence with him uh, after that, and um, I took him to Whitechapel and up to a college's practice at St Paul's one night, which he very much enjoyed. And I had a letter from him in 1990 saying he'd come back as chairman and managing director of Mitsubishi UK. Wow, head of Mitsubishi, that's some bloke, isn't it? Bell, 1878. Uh, Episcopal Church, Nagasaki, Japan. So he wanted me to go to, L to London and have dinner with him. So I duly reported to the offices in, in, in London and um, went, we went out for a Japanese meal right by Piccadilly Circus. Um, being chauffeur driven around London in a, in a, in a gold Roy's, Rolls Royce and eating at a very posh restaurant was, uh, was quite a treat. Um, Interesting evening, and uh, eventually he dropped me off at the station and, and, I, and I went home. But we did maintain contact and had a nice letter from him when he went back to, 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 to Japan two years later. Um, but he certainly got very interested in blues, came to Birmingham, and all because of this bell that survived the, uh, the 1945 um, H-bomb. So here's a diagram showing blues' output. Um, the first bell was 1852, slightly off the radar, the last 1893, the same. Uh, 40, 425 bells known to have been cast, of which 61%, 257 survive. During that time, he was casting, they were casting about 17 a year uh, for 25 years, but as you can see, the graph is very unbalanced. The early period before the bankruptcy in 1877 uh, was very busy indeed, and it was looking very promising. But after that, the business only ever really hobbled along. Where the bells went to is quite interesting. Uh, I think partly through the connection with Potts, uh, 83 of Blues' bells went to Yorkshire. That's the leading, the leading county. 63 to Warwickshire, that includes Birmingham. And then the other places are all sort of similar, Worcestershire, Wales, Lancashire, uh, all around the 30s. Just to sum up, the, uh, he, the Blues obviously relied on people from other bell foundries when he got started, and um, the, he had this promising start, but then the decline after his financial troubles. The surviving bells tend to be in singles, not rings. Blues did supply gas fittings and ornamental metalwork to several churches. St Gabriel's in Birmingham was one, where um, it's been demolished now, but it was a church where Blues had some connection. And Avon Dassett in Warwickshire, he gave some candlesticks. So there are a number of, uh, number of instances. And that interest they had in medieval craftsmanship, you might have spotted that on one of the advertisements I showed, uh, was represented in the work they did at Brailles and a couple of other churches where they cast bells with, uh, with very good facsimile inscriptions. The end of the business came with uh, the death of William Henry Maxwell Blues in 1877. He and his wife Frances are both uh, have this uh, this headstone in Sutton Coalfield Cemetery, and um, the business was purchased quite swiftly in 1888 um, by Henry Bissaker. Um, various people have speculated he might have been German or, or possibly had a South African connection, which he did, but he was born in West Bromwich, uh, nonconformist family. His his, uh, his 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 father was also English-born and called Enoch Bissaker. <laughs> Um, but he went to South Africa on, uh, for, for 14 years or so before returning with his wife, born in Grahamstown and family in 1887. And it was on coming back that he bought the business. Bissica rehung Yardley Bells in 1892, and there's a bell at Cathcart in South Africa cast by H. Bissica, Birmingham, 1893. Given that Carr had by then taken over the bell founding side of the business, I wonder if that might have actually been cast by Carr for Bissica. Anyway, uh, Bissaker's business carried on in the new Bartholomew Street premises uh, right up until the 1960s. So there was continuity, but not as far as bells are concerned. The bell founding side was subsequently taken over by Carr in 1891. There's an announcement in the Bell News and um, the, there's proof of it ready on the right hand side because Blues put this Gothic lettering on his bells and there's a car bell at Dover Harbour, uh, 1895, inscribed in the blues gothic lettering.
So that brings on to the next of the firms, which is Barwell. Barwells were probably the biggest and most successful of the three firms. And um, here are a couple of their early advertisements. <coughs> and a rather good photograph I wanted to show larger than, than, than I would if it was elsewhere, um, showing the Bells cast for Bilston in 1909. <coughs> I've been fortunate in having quite a, had quite a bit of contact with the Barwell family. Uh, particularly Peter Barwell, um, who was Lord Mayor in 1992 to three and, and died uh, last year. Um, he was a descendant of one of the, the younger branches of, uh, of the Barwell family. Uh, as I explained, the business actually split in 1898 and um, Peter's, Peter's family didn't have the, the Bell founding site, but he was a great grandson of James. Also Nicholas Barwell, who we met in Perth, uh, a great character, and his wife Muriel is still, is still alive and uh, we're still in touch with her. Um, Nicholas was a grandson of, um, of Arthur Barwell, who was the, 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 the second um, head of the foundry, and a great grandson of James. So the succession was from James Barwell, who, uh, who started the, the foundry in, in 1870. Um, through his two sons, Edward and Arthur, who took over in 1898, Arthur outlived Edward, and later um, Edward's sons, uh, Edward's descendants took over, Cecil and Brian, who are shown on the top there, uh, until, the, the fan, until the family interest in the firm ended in, uh, in 1970. That clock um, was on the, on the outside wall of Peter Barwell's house in Bloxham, and it came from the works when the works finally closed. But between them, Peter and Nicholas either sort of gave me or, or put me in touch with people who could supply quite a lot of information about the family. Uh, a lot of colourful stuff. Um, Nicholas's story is particularly interesting. Uh, one of his father, Arthur's son, uh, was a bit of a character, went on the stage, um, emigrated to New Zealand uh, and stuff like that. And um, Nicholas actually grew up with his grandfather because his, his, his father was away. Um, big stories, can't go into them now. So as far as the firm's concerned, uh, it was started by James Barwell, and I, I love this photo because my great-grandmother -grand also sat for the same photographer, uh, and we've got a print with the same signature at the bottom. Um, they were a Birmingham family too. Um, the, um, yes, the firm claimed to have been established in 1784, and that was Fidian. Uh, the Fidian name recurs, as we'll see, but by 1818, W. Fidian and Company were in Great Hampton Street as, I've got to move my face, metal candlestick makers, cock and bell founders. James Barwell didn't start in this start line of work at all. He began as a commercial traveller for Jennings and Betridge, the Japanners and maker of papier-mâché wares. So he was selling goods, very, really fine art. Have a look at, if you Google Jennings and Betteridge and look at the stuff they produced, it's fab, fabulous stuff. Anyway, he saw a business opportunity when William Fidian died in 1842. And um, in 1843, uh, the business transferred to W. Fidian and Co. But Barwell was almost certainly a partner. And by 1850, he was the owner. In 1850, he's listed as a brass cock manufacturer and bell founder. And in the following year, he's listed in the census as having 16, employed, 16 men and three boys in his em employment. We'll look later at when he commenced proper bell founding in 1870. But the firm went on to employ uh, ringers in the bell department, including Charles Fluck, who was a bell hanger from 1870s through to 1912, and secretary manager W.H. Godden, who was a well-known figure in the St. Martin's Guild. By 1881, the business had grown considerably. Barwell had 63 men, 45 boys, three girls and one woman working for him. And this is because later in life, he had a chandelier and gas fittings factory in Clement Street, Spring Hill, um, which is actually marked on the map as Bell, Bell and Brass Foundry. As I said, Arthur and Edward took control after James's death in 1898. And this is when the business split with the, the, other, the younger siblings, Frank and Herbert, taking charge of the, of the chandelier business. There's also another Barwell metal company in Birmingham. So but after around 1900, there are three different Barwell firms, uh, but the Bell Foundry was distinct and in Great Hampton Street. 
James Bowell Limited became a private limited company in 1902. The works was in Great Hampton Street, uh, just out of town from the Church Inn, which uh, probably pinpoints it for quite a few of you. You'll see that the address 40 Great Hampton Street is in the advertisements. And um, here you've got their main wares, the, 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 the valves and taps and so on that they, they mainly made. The street view premises uh, view there shows that the premises of the Victorian premises are completely gone. Um, this is just a single story building there now. They started, of course, making the sort of bells that most of these Birmingham firms were making. Uh, that's a later catalogue, but those are just very typical of what the bell was were making. Those two in the middle uh, are actually examples, both of them signed uh, James Barwell. Don't know why Barwell moved into bell founding in 1870. Uh, he'd seen the overseas market for small bells, especially in Australia, and um, done very well out of it. In 1866, he cast a proper, proper bell for a Heartland's mission station in Jamaica, which was given by a local congregation in Birmingham. And um, the, his obituary said that uh, these, these less interest in lesser bells, the making of church bells followed. That's as close as we get to a motive and a, and a reason. But in 1870, Barwell cast 10 bells, including a ring of six for Lidbury North in Shropshire. Those bells are still there, and there's some of the lettering um, presented 1870 there on the uh, for rubbing on the top. We don't know the names of the key people who helped him either, but it's, he must have had somebody like Blues did. Uh, to kickstart him into bell founding. If we look at Barwell Bells, um, the one on the left is, uh, is it's been scrapped now, but it was originally at um, Hock, All Saints in Hockley, and it sat at the bottom of the stairs at Bishop's Latimer's Church for, for many years. But it's a very typical Victorian bell, um, quite well made, nicely cast, uh, with traditional cannons on top. Uh, in the middle, uh, you've got a Doncaster head of the Barwell, very typical Barwell type of 1890, uh, Allensmore. And later on, you get flat top bells, a couple of little ones there, but quite a, some of their bigger bells were flat top too. Many of their bells have the Barwell trademark on, or of course, the founder's name in full. And the one on the top right um, shows that Barwells could churn out some really attractive work with a facsimile inscription of a 1620s bell on, on, on top there. Very nicely done indeed. When it comes to rings, uh, there, are, there are quite a few still surviving. Uh, the most complete installation, early installation, is probably Hatton. Uh, frame fittings and bells, all of 1885, apart from the ball bearings. Uh, it's a bit of a, a, a quart in a pint pot. Uh, the frame's quite slight for the, um, the space. And the configuration of bells is very odd. Um, with, compared with modern bell hanging arrangements. Uh, there's an eight in Woodstock in South Africa that some may have rung on, and um, the, the one I'm going to play you is, is Boldmere. A later peel of eight, 19, uh, 1906, um, in a cast iron frame. Uh, but let's just have a quick listen. Early Victorian eight uh, compared to what Taylor's would have produced in 1906. Uh, the rings that still exist are, are these. Um, Norton Canes have been moved. They're now at Branson in North Leicestershire. Um, but these are the rings that are still intact. And you'll see there's, um, there's three eights, uh, Blake and Hall in, in uh, St. Simon, St. Simon Linford's church out there. Uh, the former church and the bells are still in, in that tower. A uh, wonderful piece of Victorian architecture with a, with a Barwell 18. Uh, Witchbold in Worcestershire has a, has a six, and uh, there's some other sixes still around. Uh, Thermiston in Leicestershire, a later six of the uh, sort of Boldmere period. So there are Barwell bells around if you want to go and sample them. Uh, Lidbury North are quite pleasant, um, retuned uh, by Whitechapel about 20 years ago. As with blues, quite a lot of bills have been lost, um, but not, nothing like as many as in Blues's case. Um, the eight at, at Bradford St John in Yorkshire were scrapped in 1964. Uh, most of the others have just been recast. Uh, Briley Hill were very short-lived, uh, cast in 1880, six, trebles added 1888, 
uh, and completely replaced with a new pill, splendid new pill in 1899. Ranmore and Sheffield uh, were recast by Gillett and made 10 in 1934. And the others are all quite recent replacements. Welford and Aden, 1960, uh, Bilston, 1974, and Nolan, 1979. Uh, some of the lost Barwell peels. There is, as I said earlier, a Barwell 12, uh, though actually there are 10 plus a two. Uh, this is at St. Matthew's in Northampton, a big, proud church on high ground. The spire is very, very visible for miles around. And there are chimes played by this paddle keyboard um, you can see at the bottom right. They were cast by Blue, uh, by Barwell, but actually supplied and hung by Potts, the, the, the Leeds clockmakers. Uh, the hanging arrangement's a little bit odd. The ironwork's very, very uh, slender. So quite an interesting set though, and a, and a piece of major, um, major output, 1300 weight, um, 10 with two semitones. Barwell's heavy bells uh, include these three uh, over, over a ton. Uh, the biggest is the hour bell at Bangor Cathedral, um, which we'll have a quick listen to. Rather splendid old growler, actually. 1878, 29 and a quarter hundred. <laughs> There's a big bell in the tower at St. Peter's, which is now used by uh, another congregation, uh, but you won't ring it easily because it ain't got no clapper in it. Um, and blocks and bells in Oxfordshire, uh, four of the bells there are by Barwell, 1902, including the seventh, which originally weighed just over a tonne. It reached into slightly under now. Other work of Barwell's, uh, they did quite a lot of augmenting and, uh, and, and general um, rehanging and replacing odd bells. Ones that are just worth mentioning because they're in our area um, include Penn, Staffordshire near Wolverhampton. Um, couldn't resist it though because that splendid photograph that, um, that Peter Barwell let me have. Shame it's torn, but it's a beautiful photo otherwise. Um, Trebles there added in 1897, recast the whole peel, Gillets in 1929. Christopher Dalton used to say that Barwell's added trebles were particularly unfortunate, generally not quite right in tone or in, or in tune. Uh, Barwell added two trebles to the Blue Six at Netherton in 1897. They too went in 1935. Rowley Regis, three trebles there, 1887. Hansworth trebles were 1890. And at Solihull, um, Barwell cast four out of the, pill of, the old Peel of Ten. In, 18, uh, in 1894, including the trebles, all recast in 1932. As far as fittings are concerned, I don't want to go into any more detail than this tonight, but uh, there's a development of, of Blowell's fittings. They, they weren't exactly innovators, but they didn't, uh, they, they didn't hold back on making improvements, mainly following what other firms were doing. Um, the top right, top left, you've got very traditional fittings, the single bell at um, Hockley Heath. Blues was doing much the same sort of thing. Uh, wooden headstocks, strap gudgeons, um, stock hoops, and uh, board covers to the plain bearings. Below, you've got Barwell's improved traditional fittings with enclosed bearings in, uh, in cast iron housings and plate gudgeons or, or, um, uh, or renewable gudgeons. The point about the plate gudgeons was if one, if one broke or wore, you could actually just take it out and put a new one in. <coughs> in terms of frames, they moved on from doing traditional wooden frames to composite frames of uh, metal sections sandwiched in between wooden heads and sills. Two main types, uh, the, the upper one, a uh, bit flimsy and not used for a very long period of time, just briefly 1890, 1902, 1907, 1902. And then below the, the slightly more robust type, um, 1905 at Wisto. Um, both these types of frames have um, upright posts in the, um, in the corners. Uh, you can just see it there. And cars frames are the same. But they did modernize, uh, and in following Taylor's lead, they cast, um, cast iron H frames of their own design and made cast iron headstocks from around 1904 to 1905. So there's a set at Thermiston in Leicestershire. 
Again, they did work for the trade and supplied bells through clockmakers. A couple of nice examples. Uh, quite a big 10 hundred weight um, clock chime of five at, at Tyndall Baptist Church in Bristol, supplied through Joyce of Whitchurch. Also supplied through Joyce of Whitchurch were five clock bells for the Royal Ascot race course, um, 1895. Those were recast in 1960 uh, on the bells and clock and now at Swan Tower in Perth. <clears throat> Hansworth Council House uh, had three clock bells of 1878. Again, the hour bell's quite big, about 10 hundred weight, through Evans of Hansworth. Um, Carr and Barwell both worked quite extensively with, with Evans. The Hildenley bells were supplied through Potts of Leeds and uh, Michael Potts, the author of the main book on, on the clockmaking firm, has them in his house now, along with the clock. Um, but this was from a country house, three bells, 1878, through Potts. Bowells also worked with independent bell hangers or got other firms to hang their bells. James Shaw of Bradford, who became bell founders in the 1880s, um, hung the, the two Barwell eights in Yorkshire, the one at Bradford St John, 1873, and Ranmore in 1878. Thomas Blackbourne of Salisbury, who was at one time partner with William Greenleaf in the firm of uh, Blackbourne and Greenleaf, um, had a Barwell bell that he hung at um, Coombe Bissett. And William Greenleaf uh, moved on to Hereford and became a bell hanger there and uh, placed quite a lot of orders with Barwell for bells. He's seen there as uh, with, with two, two Barwell bells for Sarnsfield in Herefordshire, 1904. And there are the bells for Tenbury Wells in Worcestershire, which Greenleaf hung in 1898. Uh, Greenleaf was a past master of the College Youths and, and quite a noted London ringer. Uh, Blackbourne was also um, a, a well-known ringer. So to look at the diagram, um, you can see that as far as um, Barwell's concerns, a huge spike in 1897 for the Jubilee, but interestingly, not in 1887, when as we'll see, Carr actually um, did a lot of work. The overall range of dates for Barwell's church bells, 1866, just slightly off the end of the table here, and the last is bang on the nail, 1920. Uh, they really didn't do any bell founding proper after 1920. Heaviest bells on at Bangor, 510 in all, 74% survival rate. And that, given the loss of quite a lot of rings, that means there's still quite a lot of Barwell Bells out there. Average about 10 a year. And um, the leading counties, Warwickshire, including Birmingham, Staffordshire, and a lot in Wales, um, Worcestershire, Yorkshire, and Shropshire, you can see there. So Barwells were the biggest of the three Birmingham firms. They were successful and prolific as bell, bell hangers, as well as, as bell founders, with 237 known jobs. That's a lot more than the other two firms. They, they followed uh, what other innovation, innovations that were going on elsewhere and uh, were generally um, successful and, and well thought of in their way. After the war, um, the, the firm didn't cast any more bells, really. There were no bells cast during the war, as that graph just showed and only four small jobs afterwards. They rehung the bells at Litchfield St. Michael with a cast iron frame and recast two bells in 1919. Did a cast iron frame for Goodrich in Herefordshire, 1919, and added a treble with their necessary frame and fittings at Pelsall, 1920. And after that, the only job I've come across is an eloquent chim chiming apparatus for Newent in 1924. The old foundry had been taken over for war work in 1914 and uh, it was converted to a machine shop after the war because they needed it for other, dealing with other products. The directors decided not to reopen the bell foundry and um, the, the, the bell foundry staff moved on. They did build a separate workshop for making smaller bells, which they continued to do. Uh, they bought larger bells from both Mears and from Taylors at various dates. And um, in the 1950s, they had a, a division, Bell Foundry division, which they called Barbells Limited. Um, Barbells had actually been uh, their telegraph address from as early as 1900, but they made it a formal um, division of the company. So they were still active in the small bell world at that stage. But the bell department finally closed in 1960. They're still calling themselves Bell Founders on their main letter heading as well in, in 1949. During the war, they landed a huge government contract for producing 100,000 ARP bells. If you go to an antique shop, there's a fair chance you can pick one up, and there's a fair chance it'll be a Barwell bell. They, uh, they'd been producing these sort of school bells at about 50 a week, but they had to up the rate to 5,000 a week 
for this this government contract in 1939. Um, a big a big job and something you can still um, still re remember them by. But their main work after that was in making uh, brass cocks and, and so on in the way that they plumbers plumbers fittings as they always had done. Um, here are some uh, examples from their catalogues, and you'll notice the word Fidian occurs. Um, Fidian being their trademark and um, deriving from the original origins of the firm with William Fidian and the 1784 business. Also keen to stress established that 1784 look on their uh, on their their, um, their stationery. A rather snazzy uh, 1950s um, product catalogue there as well. The end of the firm came um, in the 1970s. Um, you can see that the 1960s adverts, there are modern looking products being produced in a Victorian factory. Uh, the way and the death of quite a lot of old established businesses like this. Cecil Barwell died in 1960 uh, after over 60 years of the firm and almost 30 of them as chairman. His son Brian carried on and modernized, as those, as those advertisements really show. I mean, even in 1956, he'd said the days of the private family business are drawing to a close. Around 1970, Barwell became part of the Delta Metal Company, and that's when the family interest ended and, uh, and Brian retired. The company was still trading as Barwell, and they moved to uh, an address in Newtown, 44 Harford Street, uh, in 1975. Uh, but five years later, it had closed down altogether. Um, there's a slight foretaste of the future there with, uh, with Brian Barwell talking to the MD of Delta Metal Company uh, in 1956. Brian is, is commemorated on that pink memorial in Edgbaston Churchyard. Moving on towards the last leg, uh, Charles Carr of the Woodland Works in Smethwick. Uh, their catalogue has this rather splendid picture of the Woodland Works. Um, with the bell foundry, the, uh, the crucible furnace works, the anti-friction metal works, uh, the, the, the uh, different departments named. There's bells in the, in the shop window on the street, Carl's Church Bell Foundry, um, the, the, the carriageway to get the goods in and out of the yard. It's a lovely, uh, typical 19th century industrial engraving, probably not quite accurately, I can't match it with a map anyway, with the 1889 map, um, showing, the, showing the foundry, redrawn, I think, to, to show off the various products and an advertisement listing some of the bells that cars had produced. The family, as far as we're concerned, really comes down to two main players. Charles Carr, born in 1807, died in 1891, who established the firm in 1863, and his son, uh, younger son, James J.W. Carr, uh, who ran the bell department from the 1880s through to 1924 when he died. He was managing partner from 1891 after Charles's death. Charles was born at Cheadle in North Staffordshire and went to work early on in, at the Oakamore Mills, uh, where he lost his arm in, a, in an accident at the, at the factory. In compensation, the owner paid, paid for him to have a private education, and um, he wasn't deterred by his, um, by, by his incapacity at all, and went on to, uh, to work hard and build up a career for himself. He went on to work for and then ran an iron foundry at Fenton near Stoke-on-Trent, and uh, he had family in Smithwick and moved there in 1862, establishing his own business two years later. He'd experimented with phosphor metals and bronze became a particular speciality of the company. He started bell founding proper in 1885, but as with the others, was a little bit before and after action. And uh, JJW took charge in, um, in 1886. It was already an established business by that date, and uh, the bell founding took its place alongside the other activities of the firm. In his will, JJW mentions uh, books and documents related to metals, bells, or the mixing thereof, which contains important secrets and calculations. Given what people think of his bells, one wonders just how, how valuable those secrets were, but it was a very precious item to him. There's some further interest in bells after they stopped casting them. Uh, minor works of rehanging that we'll have a quick look at. And some bells are ordered from tailors. For example, there's one at Tysley St. Edmunds, 1989, sorry, 1939, um, that doesn't have Carr's name on it, but was supplied through uh, their subsidiary, the Non-Ferrious Metal Company. The company changed hands in 1945 to seven, and that's when the, the family connection ended. The works closed in the early 1960s, and the site was sold for redevelopment in 1964. Um, well, if you know where the Midland Metropolitan Hospital is in, uh, in, in, um, in Grove, 
Grove Lane. Uh, well, the foundry was more or less opposite, but the site has been redeveloped now. You can see that it's shown there in the 1889 map as the Woodland Works, brackets brass. And um, there's the aerial view of 2021 showing the, the redeveloped site. And the, uh, the foundry was in the, um, the, 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 was around here. Um, you can see that the, the map doesn't bear much relation to the layout of buildings shown in that engraving that we've already, already looked at. The billheads give a fair indication of the work that the firm did. Um, Carl was very, that, and that's Charles Carr on the left, um, holding with his, with, his, um, with his limp arm, limp, limp right arm, and his left arm up against one of his patent um, crucible furnaces. They were the main, strip, main product of the firm all the way through, and they won prize, uh, prize medals for them. By 1888, he supplied over 350 of those furnaces and other tools for the foundry industry. Um, the right-hand side, there's the list, of the whole bill head, the whole of the bill head actually has a long list of products down the left-hand side. I'm only showing the ones at the top because it mentions the furnaces uh, for, for various metals and so on, and starts on the bill founding stuff. But at the top in the middle, uh, you've got um, you've got a beer engine. So uh, Charles Carr looked after ringers in other ways by making uh, beer pumps. Rather lovely bill had that. And again, the exhibitions that they went to and the awards that they won. Rather good business stationery, a couple of lovely bill heads there, uh, metal refiner, um, bell and brass founders, inventors and patentees, uh, woodland works in Smethy. And that advertisement again, They started casting bells in the 1870s. Um, there's there's a, a very dodgy uh, late night in a rainy afternoon. It was actually dark already. We had ladders up to see that bell and found Carr's earliest bell at All Saints Gravely Hill. A uh, bell of about two and a half hundred weight, just with C Carr 1875 on it. Below this one that we've now got in the Taylor Bell Foundry Museum, 1883. Don't know where it came from, but it's one of Carr's earliest bells. Their first ring of bells was 1887, the Jubilee Peal at Malins Lee near Telford. Um, they were very proud of them at the time, made a lot of fuss about them, and uh, must have also made that brass plaque that sits in the ringing room. They cast a lot of bells for Smethwick, um, but they, they had a sort of bit of a love hate relationship with the, uh, the authorities. At St Matthews, um, a 300 weight bell was given in memory of Charles Carr um, in 1891 by the firm. And a bell for St Chad's, the two parishes are now united, and uh, was given for the coronation in 1902. When I visited the, the churches in the, in the late 1980s, um, I had to scrobble underneath the main church floor with about a foot of headroom uh, to find the bell, which had been put under the floor for storage. It's been sent somewhere else now. You can see from that list in grey that Carr cast bells for a number of places in Smethwick, the board schools, a clock chime for Cape House in 1907, uh, Holy Trinity, a 10 hundred weight bell, little bells for Bearwood, St Paul, St Stephen's, for the cemetery and for the, uh, the, 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 the shelter in the park. But Carr hit trouble when he cast the Jubilee Peal for Smethwick Old Church in 1897. Uh, the first set of bells they cast were really not satisfactory at all. And uh, he was uh, required to take them down and cast them again. He cast another set in 1899, still with the date 1897 on them, no mention of the, uh, the recasting. And they too were considered very unsatisfactory and were eventually scrapped in 1963. Uh, when it came to casting the clock chime bells for the council house in 1906, um, cars were specifically excluded from the contract. Uh, the, the corporation uh, decreed that Smith of Derby were to cast the, were to make the clock and Taylor's were to cast the bells. Snubbing a local industry, um, Charles, uh, JJW Carr or the firm must have somehow rub, rubbed up the authorities the wrong way. There are a number of car appeals still surviving. Um, the, um, the, the, the table on the top right lists the, uh, the, the, the known appeals. Um, Great Hampton should be in italics as well as having been recast. But there's the eights at Lundy, um, Fenton in, Stafford, in uh, Stoke-on-Trent, Gorsinan and Dan in South Wales, uh, still there. Um, and a number of sixes, um, Rutherland, Benwell, um, Penn Doylan and Malins Lee are still there. And there's Penn's Net. Penn's Net, I'll, I'll come to on the next slide. 
Cars also, also cast a number of chimes. Um, the, the main ones are, are listed there. There's a, a very early and very out of tune clock chime at Fremantle Town Hall in Australia. Uh, Mountain Ash have been scrapped quite recently, uh, but Lan Egwad um, are after cars first got into true harmonic tuning and are supposed to be really quite pleasant bells. Three car jobs here just worth mentioning. Highly is a mixed uh, ring, four of them are car. And uh, Chris Dalton used to say that Carl actually started casting bells that were quite well in tune with themselves, but not very well in tune with each other. And I think that re this recording of Highly demonstrates that brilliantly. Uh, you will laugh. <laughs> They are incredibly long, odd struck. So if you're complaining about that ringing, it's that's that's why. You might have recognized the voice of the conductor as R.C. Kipping. Uh, there's a, quite a nice eight at Cross Stone. They're now at Thornhill. They're having been transferred in 1910, uh, in uh, 1980. Uh, one of Carr's better jobs um, and uh, one of the examples of his true harmonic bells, like Gore Simon. But Penn's Net, although installed in 1926, were actually Carr's Dick Whittington Maiden Peel, um, cast in 1891, but he would not sell them. He was very, very proud of them. He'd lend them to theatres all up and down the country, and uh, they didn't sound very good, but he thought the world of them because none of them required tuning and were roughly the right notes. When they added the trebles in 1926, they never came out very well either, and um, Penn's Net are, uh, have been retuned in, in quite recent times, uh, but were always regarded as Carr's bad joke. Some of the jobs that cars did, um, they rehung the eight at Berwick on Tweed uh, in 1894 and recast two bells. Um, their bell hanger, Jack Buffery, rang the tenor for the first peal of the, on the bells when they were redone. Not a very good job, they are unringable very soon afterwards. Those of you who have been to the amazing John's Lane, the Augustinian Church and Augustine and St John, uh, it's just so Dublin and so Catholic. Um, it's a marvellous place and an incredibly difficult, nasty climb to get up there. Um, Cars added two trebles to the Murphy 8 in 1898, and uh, quite an idiosyncratic peel they are in that oblong tower, anti-clockwise too. And uh, the third one is my old parish church where I went to school in the primary school bang next door at Aston Cantlow. And I wish I'd listened to the tower captain in my early ringing days because he knew um, Charles Carr, uh, Carr, JJW Carr, when he had a cottage in the village and also was uh, famed locally for having had a car um, and um, around the, the year of his death, he gave he get, he, he uh, got the treble put in to make the six the five up to a six. He was also involved in the local uh, local uh, club in the village, which he was a benefactor to, and um, so he had he had quite strong connections with the village. And and um, Alan Woodfield knew all about him, but I never really listened to what uh, what Alan could have told me. Carl's Big Bells, uh, quite, um, quite interesting. Uh, the Marischal College at uh, Aberdeen, splendid tower. And I thought it was going to be quite, a, quite an interesting installation. I'd like to hear the bell. Unfortunately, it's been taken down and it's sitting there among a pile of um, pigeon droppings by a corrugated iron partition. Uh, no chance of hearing that. But it's 3,100 weight supplied through Evans, the clockmaker. Just before he died, um, Carr had superintended the making of a 3,500 weight bell for Demerara Cathedral in the West Indies, hung on a Barwell type cast iron headstock. And I do wonder if Barwell's carried on making the stocks for, uh, for cars. Two other big bells, one of them supplied through a clockmaker, uh, a Wesleyan chapel in, in, um, in Bingley in Yorkshire and Blackpool Town, Town Hall. Those are the ones over, over the town anyway. Car bells have some quite interesting features. Um, small bells have these, these headstocks uh, of a peculiar shape and that have a bar threaded through them. You can see there's a hole in the middle, um, a, a square hole set, um, set ob obliquely uh, for the bar stock to go through. But unfortunately they fail. Um, they, they, they're not a very an ingenious design, but not a very clever one. Car's bells often have these rather crudely formed inscriptions on. Uh, in big chunky letters with full stops in between. 
And they also have extra molding wires. Um, if you find a bell that has any inscription on at all, but has a, a configuration of, of more than three molding wires there, and perhaps three and four up here, um, it's almost certainly a car bell. They had um, cast bells with angular, small angular cannons, uh, later sort of um, small, small cannons, angular cannons, but they cast flat top bells too. Most of their later bells were, were flat topped. So those are just some of the features of car bells. In terms of um, fixtures and fittings, uh, here's one of the, uh, the bells of the, the type I was mentioning. And this, had, this argent has had to be repaired um, because it had failed like the one I showed you. Cars fittings changed very little through the, uh, the 30, or 30 or 40 years that they were making bells. Usually wooden headstocks, bolts through the, down, the, down the side, four bolts through the top of the bell, uh, bolts down the side of the headstock. And these um, very standard composite frames, a bit like bell wells, but flimsier, posts in the corners, wooden heads and wooden sills. They used um, uh, plate gudgeons and, and enclosed bearing housings like Barwell did, and both Barwells and cars used these rather odd um, metal, metal um, housed pulleys for, for, for rope rollers. So here's our production graph. 1897, a big spike for cars. Um, sorry, I was wrong about 1887 when I said they, that cars had had the, uh, the lion's share in 1887. Um, the first bell, 18, uh, 1875, I don't know why I've typed 1827. The last in 1929, just a little bit outside the, uh, the, the main diagram here. Heaviest we've seen, Aberdeen. Um, those figures for production are wrong as well. Uh, I, 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 this is where I was really running out of time. Uh, but the counties are right. Uh, Worcestershire, uh, no, it's not, it's Wales. <laughs> Sorry about the untidiness here. Wales was absolutely dominant. Um, they did so much work down in Glamorgan and Carmarthenshire, uh, a real following down in, in South Wales in the 1890s, uh, which puts Wales very clearly in the lead with 99 bells. Then Staffordshire, Yorkshire, Worcestershire, uh, Warwickshire and so on. They were particularly good at working with the pot makers, uh, particularly pots, and several chimes of bells went up through, through pots. Quite a lot of bell hanging work, 141 jobs. They were the second firm after Taylor's to adopt true harmonic tuning, but, tuning, but with mixed success, uh, like that highly recording shows. They too went into war work during the war, but here's an advertisement of 1918, getting people ready for the, after the war. Uh, get on, buy your bells. That's what we're gonna provide you after the, after the war, but still carrying on with the other sort of works they always did. In the 1920s, they amalgamated with a non-ferrious casting company of Birmingham, a smaller firm, and they, they, they would join the companies for the rest of the time of the business. And there are some of the castings that they were making. They moved away from bells into other types of castings, as you can see from these advertisements. But they did carry on doing a small amount of bell work. Um, they did a little bit of bell hanging, uh, finishing in 1926, really, with the, the, the job at Penn's Net and just down the road, Wordsley, where they put in a steel frame. Um, but they rehung the bells at Cookley and Wolverley in, um, in 1948, 1949, and they'd done odd little jobs in between. So I think they'd kept one person on the staff who still knew about bells. They had a few spats with tailors over the years. Um, mainly about um, Taylor's rubbishing their work. There's a marvellous letter for Castle Bromwich, where something had appeared in the press about um, Carr's work being, uh, being very much decried. And uh, Taylor, Carr's wrote to Taylor's asking them formally to rescind it, or else they'd face prosecution. But they did also buy bells from Taylor's occasionally, but in 1957 wrote, this firm is no longer engaged in casting but in church bell casting or in repairs. So that's when the foundry, uh, the cars bell work really did finish. Just towards to round off, um, these firms were all, as I said earlier, very actively involved in Birmingham ringing. Barwell certainly made a pride of having ringers on their staff because it made that connection with ringers and, and helped ringers trust them when it came to estimating. Some of the well-known ringers who associated included Jack Buffery, uh, a big name in the later 19th century, and a big man, um, called some quite important peals, including, uh, we attempted one, one long length that he was calling. And um, there he is in, in, in older age, but he worked for Barwells and later for Cars. He certainly worked for Cars by the early 1890s, but had worked for Barwells in the 80s. W.H. Godden, Secretary of the St. Martin's Guild for many years, worked for Cars for 54 years and was still working for them at the time of his death. He was their manager and also their man of business. Um, 
Tom Miller, uh, always uh, said to have been a delightful man, impish sort of man with a good sense of humour, a uh, good sense of fun, actively involved in a lot of the main uh, feats of the St Martin's Guild, handbells and tower bells, worked for Barwell for 30 years, worked for Carr as their tuner in the, in the latter days, and then, um, as we'll see shortly, did carry on with bells later. And the famous Jimmy Groves, uh, worked for Barwells from the late 1890s through until late 19, uh, 1919. Uh, but he, of course, was a big name conductor and composer, handbell ringer. Um, and here you've got a couple of a couple of the greats of St Martin's Guild. Godden even rang 100, 165 peals, but mostly um, Stedman and Gramsir. There was a little bit of an afterlife. Uh, Jimmy Groves carried on for the next 10 years of his life as an independent bell hanger with some 30 bell hanging jobs to his name. Uh, there's a cast iron headstock with Groves Birmingham on it, uh, possibly cast by Barwells. Um, Philly probably didn't have the resources to cast a headstock himself. And Tom Miller, uh, in his long life, he, he lived well into his 90s, um, uh, ended up um, advertising um, as a church bell hanger and tuner in his own, his own right, uh, but also became, as he had, always, had been, a handbell specialist. He'd done the handbells for, for Barwell and carried on making handbells and, and uh, repairing handbells later on. I've got a set of 12 Miller handbells that I'd really love to peel at St Chad's sometime. Uh, we did have a talk about it a, while, a couple of years back because Tom Miller was in charge at, at, at St, St Chad's and it'd be nice to take his, take his handbells home and uh, ring a peel on them. Um, but there's one of the straps with his, uh, with his name on from, from my set of handbells. So that's it. Um, a quick scamper through um, the work of the firms of Blues, Barwell and Carr. And I think, as you'll see, um, their bells may have largely disappeared. Uh, they may not be very highly regarded these days, um, but Birmingham was a significant centre of bell founding uh, for some 60 years. And um, I hope, you, uh, hope you've enjoyed hearing a bit more about it. Chris, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that, Chris. That was uh, that was wonderful. Um, I, I will give you a few minutes to uh, to sort of uh, rest, rest your, your voice, uh, and I'll just spend a couple of minutes uh, advertising a couple of events coming up, and then hopefully, you know, I'm conscious uh, of time, but hopefully, you know, you, you might be able to to answer a couple of questions if, if people have them. I'm fine, but I'm sorry if I've kept people out longer than they would have, would have wished. <laughs> no, not at all. I think it was a you know a really highly engaging story that really sort of wrapped wrapped people in. And from a personal perspective, I really enjoyed seeing pictures of, of Tom Miller because we're we're pretty sure um, that he 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 was the one who worked really hard on the handbells that we uh, you know that you talked about earlier on. So it's nice to add a you know a photo to a, to a name. Um, I'll just advertise a couple of events uh, that we've got coming up for the St Martin's Guild. So just a reminder, um, particularly to members, although other people are very welcome to be involved as well, uh, that on the 15th of May, we have our uh, kind of returning to ringing, Saturday the 15th of May, returning to ringing uh, um, sort of training day. Um, and that part of that is our business meeting that starts uh, starts that day off. And uh, we have the cake, uh, bake, uh, the, um, sorry, the online uh baking contest so again that deadline is this friday so um again if you're you're aiming to bake a cake please uh please remember that the deadline's this friday instructions have come out to the guild as well uh next wednesday we are joined by steve and rowena shipley uh from the handbell ringers of great britain uh you know an organization actually that you'd think would have a lot to do with the central council of, of and and, and uh tower bell ringers but actually i don't think they do really so i'm um, really pleased to welcome uh, some local ringers steve and roe shipley uh, who will be speaking to us about their um about the handbell ringers of great britain yes susan i do mean the, the bake-off i seem to have lost the the ability to speak fluently tonight so i do apologize it must be a long hours at work um Super. So if uh, if anyone, you know, I say perhaps sort of five, five, ten minutes uh, of any questions that people, people might have burning questions, or I'm sure if, uh, you know, if time ha has run out, uh, I'm sure, uh, Chris, you'd be happy to sort of receive some questions by uh, by email, perhaps. Um, but again, if you do have any questions, uh, either type them in the chat box or please unmute yourself and, and feel free to, to, to talk. Um, Chris, I had a, a, two questions really in, in the back of my mind. That the first is, it seems to me that um, there's a really high, the real high concentration of sort of bell foundries in in Birmingham. Um, you know, in sort of the the 1800s. I was wondering whether this was the case for other cities, or whether Birmingham 
with the exception of London, whether Birmingham was was a bit of an exception. Well, Bristol had a couple of foundries running more or less simultaneously, but in in some ways the um, the smaller foundries uh, more or less died out around the time Wellens and James kicked off as a big player. So it's not quite the same. But I mean, in London, you had got um, you got Warners only only a um, quarter of a mile away from Whitechapel, and you'd got Gillets down the road um, in Croydon. So uh, London London certainly had them, but elsewhere, no. Um, Birmingham was was unique in that. Okay. And do you, what would you think, sort of the location and Birmingham's sort of ring in history and, and the resources being close by, do sort of those count towards why Birmingham had such a high concentration? Or I don't, I don't know. I mean, because, but because they got uh, such such strength of metal trades, um, it, you know, I, I, I can see that, uh, you know, the, um, the the capability was there developing, uh, developing a specialist industry. And it grew out of a sort of already inter- uh, already there, present interest in small bells. So yeah. not sure there's anything more like, you know, uh, wise I can say about it than that. <laughs> And, and I just wondered, Chris, what your thoughts on this were. And do you know, obviously now in a situation where we, we've lost really almost all the well, local foundries, you know, and obviously we're left with uh, well, two really sort of much bigger foundries, I think, unless you're about to correct me. Do you think Ringin has lost anything with the closure of, of, of those sort of local foundries? I just wonder if you thought, you know, we've, we've lost anything in Ringin and perhaps the wider society. It's nice to have choice, um, you know, because the, the uh, w- when Whitechapel and of course Whitechapel does still exist through through Westleys, but um, the, the there was always the the argument I think that you know Whitechapel and Taylors produced and Gillets when they were still going as well, all produced bells of slightly different character. They all produced true harmonic bells, but slightly different character. And there is a room, there is space, room for going for the, your preferred choice. You know, if you happen to like one, prefer one, one, one above the other, uh, there are there are differences there. Um, it's not so much about the tuning; it's more about the the, the, the tonality, the timbre of, of of a bell. And um, so, having choice is good. Uh, what people think about the uh, the the use of the overseas, the European foundries, I, I don't know. I, they they certainly are producing some some very fine sounding bells, um, but uh, you know. I'm, I'm for supporting the British industry. <laughs> Super, thanks, Chris. Uh, John, I think you have a, a question. I do, yes. You mentioned um, Hatton, Chris. And Hatton, uh, they're, they're unusual. I didn't know they were, uh, their origins particularly, but um, they're unusual in that they were reduced, I don't know what the term is, de-augmented from an eight, apparently. And I wondered if the bells that were removed were also uh, from the same foundry. No, the bells that went were a John were a John Ruddle of Gloucester eight. Oh, okay. um, the, the back six were eighteen oh seven. The trebles were eighteen seventeen, and um, there was there's a record of one peel on them. Uh, quite why they were replaced, I don't know. And Ruddle's bells of that period are not uh, don't, don't have a particularly good reputation. Mm. And um, I should, can imagine that the Barwell ring was was considered to be considerably better at the time they went in. Um, perhaps not, that's not how they'd be uh, rated today. Right, yes, yes. I don't know where they fitted them, because they're a tight fit, aren't they, the bells that are there? In yes, the, and the tenor was 1300 weight before, so they, they must have been quite a squeeze in, the, in that tower. Yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting, thanks. Super. Thank you, John. Um, the chat box has been very quiet. A couple of thanks coming in to, to you, Chris, but otherwise the chat box has been very quiet. I don't know if anyone else has any questions. I... I don't want to monopolise all of all of Chris's time, but with the with the silence, I will ask one further question. Then, then Chris, um, uh, you just had a, a lovely comment coming in. Uh, encyclopedic, uh, sort of your encyclopedic knowledge, uh, Chris, has been uh, highlighted there by by Liz and, and Stuart. Um, and you've touched on this, I, th- I think, around choice, um, Chris. But I have one final question for you. Um, and I wonder what what factors do you think helped ringers choose their their foundry? You know what what made sort of this at Martin Ring go to Blues, for example? What kind of different things were um, were in the? Do, do you think do you, in your research? I think in the 18th century, um, you know the the sort of bells that the Ruddles were turning out um, were were just what people wanted. You know they were they were so popular. 
Um, it was a very ideal instrument for change ringing in some ways, not too, not too resonant, very percussive, um, perhaps not musical to the modern ear, but you get a, you can get a wonderful beat on a, on a ruddle peel. And, um, you know, that was, that was what ringers actually wanted. Um, so, but other than that, there's always, there's always, you know, local people going to the foundry that they know and have got, they know people who work for, same sort of things that happen today, really, you know, what, why, do, why do people prefer the different foundries now? There's, there's, a, there's a lot of um, personal, personal preference in it. Super. Connections. And one final question is coming in. I think it's a really nice question to end on, and you might wince at this and, and not like it, but we'll, we'll see where we go. Uh, uh, Mr. Austin asks, do you have a favourite ring by a Birmingham founder? Quite difficult, quite difficult. <laughs> well, I was, I was going to say something about Cradley, actually, because uh, I think that, uh, you know, the, 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 the reputation around here used to be um, based on what Cliff Skidmore or Martin Fellows used to say. They even sound like a pack of yowling dogs. You know, which is wonderful, uh, wonderful description. Uh, but I actually think I rather like Cradley. I've run a couple of peels there and uh, always think that for a Victorian ring, they're OK, very much OK. Um, so I, I, without giving it too much thought, I think I'd probably um, not just because James is listening and they're his bells, but uh, I, I do think they're, they're, they're definitely an acceptable ring of eight, by, even by Victorian standards. And um, so, yeah, that's where my mark could go. <laughs> oh yes and heather's just reminding me i do i do like brails but they're not actually a complete booze ring <laughs> who can't like braille especially when you go there and hook norton and outing and great chew <laughs> super thanks chris well um i will just take this opportunity then to, to, to thank you i think we uh, you can see that the thanks coming into the chat box now and people just talking about the knowledge that you you have and clearly the passion you have you know us at the st martin's guild have been happy to ha uh, sorry been um really privileged to have you come to talk to us chris not once not twice but three times so um you know on behalf of the guild on behalf of all of us here tonight a huge thank you for coming to share your your extensive knowledge uh, with us it you know it really is appreciated and i think you you know you really engage you know, the narrative that you weave really engages uh, us uh, you know and of course for, for us in Birmingham you know, it's a very special part of our, our history so um, you know on behalf of all of us here thank thank you so much um, you're more than welcome thank you <laughs> super please have a look uh, in the chat box I'll stop recording now um, have a look in the chat box have a look at the thanks uh, and then I'll, I'll end the meeting in just a couple of minutes um, once you've had a chance to have a look at all of the thanks the well-deserved thanks coming in <laughs>